Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back to the next stage sessions for another of our live streams coming to you from Web Summit HQ and being to LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter or X live. I'm Casey Lau, the co host of the Web Summit Lisbon. I'm also your host today. I'm excited because this one is about tech for good movement. But before we get into it, I want to remind our audience that Web Summit 2023 is just around the corner, uh, like in four weeks, actually. So you can join us in Lisbon from November 13th to the 16th. We've got VR, VC, self-driving cars, Web3, Gen AI, you name it, we're covering it. Grab your tickets now at webmasummit.com slash tickets. I'll be co-hosting Center Stage. We'll be having the CEOs of companies like Anthropic, Y Combinator, and Naver and celebrity founders like Jillian Anderson, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, and Amy Poehler. So feel free to reach out on the Web Summit app once you get your tickets, and I'll treat you to a coffee in the city of Lisbon. Today, on the Next Stage Sessions, we're looking at the Tech for Good movement, and we've assembled an amazing panel of speakers who have their collective finger on the pulse of all the innovations happening in this space right now. So let's bring them on up. There should be some music here, like kind of like theme music to bring everybody on. All right. Our panel will be discussing how the tech industry can think about getting on board and will leave us with some great takeaways. I'd like everyone to say hi to Sita from CM Capital, Nick from Planet A, and Hind from Generation Politique. Hello, everyone. Could you briefly introduce yourself and tell the audience what you guys do? Let's start with Sita. Sure. Um, I, I run a fund. Uh, called Siam Capital. We're a sustainability thematic fund uh, with a bias to partner with extraordinary entrepreneurs early. Uh, we look at what we call transformative innovation or transformative technology um, at the intersection of sustainability and consumer across the value chain. Great. Hind, where are you and where, what do you do? I'm in Paris. I'm a political strategist and entrepreneur. I am the founder of Génération Politique, which is a political strategy a civic tech company. So we work with politicians and poli political leaders to help them face some of today's major challenges in politics, mostly with political strategy, participation, and new technologies. Great. And last but not least, Nick. Uh, thanks, first of all, for giving giving us a chance to be here. Super, super stoked about it. Uh, I'm Nick. I'm based out of Berlin. I co-founded a fund called Planet A Ventures. We're an early stage green tech fund um, that tries to take science into account whenever we invest and follow on um, and also has a veto voice. And uh, as the name indicates, we, are, we care about not only climate, but also about biodiversity, waste um, reduction, resource savings and so on. Great. Amazing. All right. So the agenda today is that I will lead the beginning of the roundtable discussion with this panel, and then we'll invite some of the startups that are exhibiting at Web Summit to ask some questions. And also to the live audience, you can type out questions on whatever social media platform you're on, and I'll try to get to a few of them at the end. Um, after two record years of for climate and purpose-driven tech, the first half of 2023 has been a bit slower in terms of funding. Still, Europe's three largest funding rounds of this year have been in climate tech with huge, huge rounds raised. Nick, first kind of like talk a little bit about, because you're the one that just raised earlier this year, um, your first fund, 160 million euros from an intriguing roster of LPs, including BMW, the Danish Pension Fund, and the founders of HelloFresh and Zalando. How easy, how easy or how difficult or challenging was it to raise that fund in this climate? No pun intended. Mm, I, I love it. Um... <laughs> Honestly, uh, I, th I think it's a nuance, but it made a big difference. Uh, we didn't close the fund this year, but uh, last year, and we were pretty much there by roughly a year ago. So, so in, in summer 2022, we were more or less done with fundraising and then as it always is, it takes some time to communicate. And I would say, um, I, I'm, I'm not trying to small our, um, our message, but I think then it was definitely an easier time to raise. I think over the last year, the fundraising environment, both for startups as well as funds, has been uh, dramatically um, decreased in, in the availability of cash. And I can I can speak about uh, the fund side. Uh, we, we're not raising right now, so this is this is only secondhand knowledge. But we still talk to a lot of our peers and also LPs. And right now, the fundraising environment for funds is um, desolate, I would say. Uh, there is uh, 
a multitude of reasons, uh, no returns on, on one hand, and then also some pacing and re-upping uh, on the LP side for the existing portfolios and uh, the, the underlying funds. Um, but generally, I would say it really, uh, you can really feel a difference between 21 and uh, 23. Mm. How about you, Sita? How, how's your, how was fundraising for yourself? Sure. So uh, I de definitely echo some of Nick's sentiment in that the, the market environment has shifted dramatically. Um, so we, we actually, we, um, we had our first fund um, at the end of 2021. Um, and we did a first close um, of, our, of our second fund actually just a short few months ago. Um, so the air is definitely different, but I will say that just to provide um, the, the glass half full solace comment to that is that the funding environment is definitely different, but the attention for climate broadly, sustainability, even impact, if we were to use a different proxy term, is still, I think, very, very powerful. If anything, I mean, I'm sure you guys are seeing some of these pitch book numbers. It is one of the only areas that have continued to see pretty significant traction uh, in this downturn. And I think a lot of it is just propelled by the um, the urgency that is that is the world we live in. Yeah. Uh, also, of course, just a ton of regulatory support for it. Uh, it's not to say that it's an easy fundraising environment. I'll say that for founders, especially. Um, but having said that, I, I think that we're all in a space that we feel like we're here for the long run. And as a, as a consequence of that, it's like we go through cycles and one of which is, you know, we're still in a time period where regardless of the fundraising environment broadly, um, which, you know, because, because we, we are active, we can't actually comment on it from a specific angle. I will say that we're lucky that we're in a space that people care a lot about and are willing to put a lot of dollars behind. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that every startup listening should hear, listening to this, it's not easy to write, raise money for a startup, but also for a fund is also challenging all the time as well. Hind, how about yourself? Um, you're not a, in a fund, but what do you see? Do you see, how do you see the investment landscape, uh, maybe from France perspective or from EU perspective? I think in France, you know, there has been a, a lot of things that were done at um, a more, you know, governmental level to kind of help small startups and small companies in the impact world develop. And it's been especially the case with this administration because it's been a priority since the beginning. You have a lot of really huge successes of impact successes in France, like back market insect and, and many other large companies. I know a lot of young entrepreneurs who started two years ago, one year ago, and we're kind of also getting this backdrop because I think it's, it just has, it's the case not even just for impact. I think a lot of investors from what we saw here in France um, were looking for something different, I would say, something maybe uh, that has a more documented impact, something that would be more towards the long run, which wasn't always the case here because we did have a trend at least from what we were able to, to see of uh, starting from, you know, 2018, 2019. And I think in 2018 was the first Tech for Good Summit in France, which was created by Emmanuel Macron, the president. But then a lot of companies weren't able to, to follow up and to keep going. But I think um, it's pretty, it's been the same here. There are multiple parameters, but the major thing is that it is still difficult to raise, but not just for, you know, not just for impact companies, but it's even more so for impact companies, although there are many, many, many opportunities like because governments and lo local and national governments are looking for solutions for many, many, many priorities. Many of their political priorities can be a reindustrialization. It can be the green, you know, new green economy. And so <clears throat> a lot has been done at this uh, level, but I think there's Absolutely, uh, it, it is difficult to raise from the few startups that we were able to discuss this uh, topic about. Interesting. I will. Great, um, great. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Casey. Didn't no, go ahead. I was, no, no, go ahead. I just wanted to end on um, on a slightly more positive note on the fundraising environment for startups. Um, I'm sure Nick, you've spent a lot of time in this data as well, but if you look through how venture has performed as an asset class. Um, some of the best performing vintages 
um, have come out of when the market has been the most quote unquote depressed, right? Following 08, 09. And that same parallel is actually true for, for startup companies. So some of the best, most, what we say, like transformative technology companies, be it platforms um, that, that touch the consumer or actually just pure tech companies, um, often are born out of these crises too. So I think that there is some sort of um, survival bias. So when we talk to our founders, we say, just stay in the arena. Um, and a lot of the times the companies that are able to persist are the ones that need to exist. And I think that that's something that we should all get really excited about. That's very good. I think that's a great way to put it. Um, I'm looking at the people logging in to watch our live stream. We got people from Frankfurt, Germany, Inverness, Scotland, Ukraine, Brazil, Qatar, Dubai, Scotland. Everybody's here to listen to you guys. So I want to kind of uh, paint a picture. These are, from, these are other startups. These are probably some other uh, venture capitalists in the space. Let's talk a little bit now about the high level trends in the sustainable investment space. What are you guys seeing happening right now and as we go into 2024? Nick, let's start with you. Um, what do you think would be more interesting for the audience in the overarching general environment and how the sentiment is or actual like I'd say both. Companies? I'd like to hear from you. I'd like to hear on the environment. I'd also like to hear yeah. what you guys are looking at specifically. Happily. Um, when we set out with Planet A, we said it's not enough to only fund software. We also need to look into hardware because obviously um, we can optimize, but we are, we're not really able to decrease uh, everything that we already emit today by only improving on software. And so hardware is um, one of the most uh, relevant layers to all of this. And we, we like to say that, or, like all other people did so as well, um, climate tech, um, or green tech isn't a future industry, but it's the future of all industries. It's going to impact the way we produce energy, how we store it, how we get from A to B and so on. And in our work with uh, our own portfolio and also portfolio companies of other, uh, of other funds and peers, one thing has been uh, becoming more and more visible, which is that hardware is obviously a different animal and that there is currently a couple of very systemic issues within the european union and also including the uk here uh, when it comes to funding those companies um, and we are talking about the first and the second value of death the first value of death is uh, somebody tries to start something in the lab uh, and then um, needs funding for that which is um, solvable like there, there is a lot of grant programs and uh, it could always be more but there is a lot of room for hope the second valley of death is much more severe it's the first of a kind production facility the first of a kind reactor that a company is looking to produce and um, it any company that's usually series a stage has to overcome the gap between um either raising absurd amounts of equity and therefore diluting or not even finding capital in the first place, um, or trying to somehow uh, make a case for this already being applicable for something called project finance. So project finance, uh, equity is venture capital gives you money, venture capital fund gives you money, and then you uh, sell shares to, to that fund. Um, and project finance is basically um, I have external capital and I repay that debt, that uh, credit line through future revenues that will come out of it. And that project-based financing is something that is very established. For example, every uh, solar park, wind park also is project finance, but because there is no tech risks any, any more involved. And especially for the first of a kind, that project-based financing isn't really applicable on a large scale. And the cruxes we have an outstanding amount of um, programs within the European Union that are in theory perfectly set up to cover exactly that. So for example, the EU said uh, to credit institutions, if you are willing um, to give out the credit line to a series A stage company, an early stage company, we are looking to ensure your risk up to 80 or 90% um, if the company should become a right of at the end of the day. But the systemic issue is that there is no communication between those different parties. Most of the banks are not aware. The ones that are aware are not really sure of how to tap into those programs. There is reputational damages or fear of reputational damages and so on involved. And what we're seeing on a very systemic level is that while there is a lot of early stage funding for green tech uh, and climate tech companies available right now, on the equity side, the later stage, everything around debt and potentially blend finance products 
is not not super not super exciting and maybe to to um just name um one or two one or two things that, that i'm personally super excited about on the investment side one is um long duration energy storage so we all have uh, um, firsthand experienced what changing energy markets will do to us um, it increases volatility of energy prices significantly um, and potentially also comes with very large um, political dimensions um, the U european union has um, put a program in place which is called the net zero industry act in zia um, which will require us to produce 40 percent of the critical infrastructure in europe until 2030 that also includes long duration energy storage and we're not there by no means also not on yeah. the grid side and also not on solar panels but that's i think a really interesting part and so i'm looking into thermal storage into different types of electrochemical storages and also into um, kinetic energy storages that's one part and then large organizations looking a lot into precision fermentation right now because um, with the right energy mix um, that can solve a lot of the uh, nutrient war that we have right now. A lot of it will be commoditized, but a lot of the things uh, we need, uh, the picks and shovels, so to say, of, of flavor, uh, will come out of um, precision fermentation. So this is something we're also excited about. Okay, great. How about you, Sita? What, what high-level trends are you seeing in this in the sustainable investment space right now? Do you, I guess I would echo, you said you want both from a market standpoint and also specific things we're seeing. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, I guess maybe I'll comment um, on the former first is, I think, I, I actually am curious to get, um, Nick, your take on this as well, sitting in Europe, but uh, in, in the US, this whole broad subject of investing in climate or sustainability has been, uh, somewhat attached to the broader mandate of investing in ESG and impact, yeah. which has, if anyone is reading the headlines these days, um, really been quite polarizing and in some ways quite politicized. Um, and I think that that's something that is particularly disencouraging for us in some ways, because, you know, at the end of the day, I don't think that the data would back why whether, whether or not we should be investing in this space, but it is unfortunate that we've seen it become almost a topic of contention largely for political will. Um, so that's something that we're seeing. I mean, we saw, you know, BlackRock taper their language. Um, so I think a lot of the times the onus is going to fall on actors in the private sector to be able to continue to keep up the momentum in this um, in this whole arena, if you will. Um, so that's one trend that we're seeing. And I think that um, it shouldn't discourage us, but it's, it's just something to keep in mind um, because it is one of these areas that, is no longer the obvious case that we should be paying attention to. Um, the other thing I would just say is um, also a macro trend, but it, in, in more specific uh, applications in this whole um, area is everyone keeps talking about the impact of AI on sustainability or climate. I will, I will liken that saying, if you will, to basically saying the impact of tech on like the economy. It is so broad. Um, so, you know, one, one area that we're spending quite a bit of time on as well within that, uh, intersection is really trying to understand the AI's impact uh, on data and shadow models, because a lot of the times, a lot of these sustainability businesses, they're trying to build their need to exist and their need to exist is usually sits on being able to demonstrate the data to show that like for a period of time, this is why, uh, say, be it weather patterns or whatever it might be, this is why we need to focus on this now, be it in agriculture and, and you know, with applications and pr precision fermentation or whatever it might be. But the availability of that data has been pretty limited so far. So we're particularly excited about that. Um, I would say the other area that is pretty core to the focus of our fund is, as I alluded to earlier, we focus really on the intersection of sustainability and what we say consumer across the value chain. And the reason for that is that we believe, you know, either by choice or by necessity, most likely for, for the latter, consumers will have to change every facet of their lives, which will create a ripple effect, which will then force businesses to change the way they do business, essentially impacting the consumption infrastructure. So to borrow Nick's language as well, we're looking at a lot of picks and shovels businesses that are going to enable a new type of consumption, right? So let's give an example. There's a lot of regulation for a variety of different applications um, within the retail space, but one of which we've paid a little bit of attention to is the sourcing of clean ingredients. 
So a lot of retailers are demanding, be it brands in skincare or beauty or, or, or in food, that there are certain ways that they need to source their ingredients um, or the certain ingredients that they're, they have to include to be able to sell in different regulatory markets. Um, so one of the areas that we're looking at is like, all right, how do we arm companies, brands, um, any people who are producing these goods that ultimately sell to the consumer with the way in which um, they can source these materials and also just at the first place, like being able to, uh, what's it called, recognize what they actually need to reformulate. So we're looking at a lot of these, I would say, like consumer adjacent businesses uh, that will impact the way in which we consume in businesses and the way they do business. Interesting. How about you, Hind? How about there are a lot of government and uh, impact investment trends that you can talk about a little bit about? Yeah, I would say that honestly, from what we've been able to see, there are more opportunities and more calls for grants and for contributions than startups and entrepreneurs willing to go after them. Um, not because there aren't enough startups, but because because it's a huge priority for this administration and it's a huge priority at the local level as well. A lot has been done to try to come up with solutions when you go to forums in, in Paris or to gatherings and conferences where you have a lot of elected officials. You always, the topic of climate change and of, of sustainability is always at the heart of what is discussed. It's always at the heart of what the companies that they collaborate with um, is discussed. So. I would say that, like, I think probably in the impact world, tech for good word world, in France, more than half of probably something like sixty percent of of startups or of new entrepreneurial ventures have to do with climate change. You also have a lot of things, you know, to get to just uh, social impact, and I think that. When you look at it from a governmental level, there's a lot going on and it will keep going because this administration is in office until 2027. But uh, here again, because it's a priority for this administration and it's kind of something that can be very, very, um, let's, let's say, very flexible. It's, uh, I mean, in conversations we could have had with some entrepreneurs or people who just started out in the, the impact world, they're, they're not pretty certain about the future. They don't know what's go going to be happening next because it is such a political priority. But here, the, the huge, I would say, one of the huge things that have been coming up, especially in the past year or two years, has been this, uh, this, this tech for good issue dedicated to, to you know, industries, like uh, large industries, like uh, car industry or or, uh, you know, like back market, just uh, everything that is recycled or reused. And uh, you, you do see a lot of things going around that. A lot of companies, a lot of startups that are really doing well in those sectors. But here again, I think it, it also has to do with scaling. I think we've done a really great job in France in the past few years. Also, thanks to, to a lot of work that's been done by public officials to, to help entrepreneurs a really start off their business, their tech for good, especially, especially climate change business. But it's it's also still a little bit hard to, to keep up with other countries and even with Germany or, or with the, the UK. But I would say these are the, the major trends and uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of help going on and happening at so the political level when it comes to tech for good movements. Okay, so that's that's a great high level thing. So I want to kind of talk a little bit more like the ground level. I visit a lot of startup communities around the world. I see what governments are doing to bring in tech companies to different countries. Uh, this is an open question for any of you. I'd like to know what do you think is going to help um, promote more and attract more innovation, more tech companies that come into? Do they need to? Is it a government thing? Is it the VCs writing checks for this specific sector? What do you guys think? Like, how do you talk to startups? What do you think needs to be done? Or who's doing? great things right now that you're seeing or like that should be replicated in other countries, like either in the EU or the States or in Asia, anybody more, who's most passionate about that. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take the question to start. I imagine you guys will chime in. Um, I I'd say it's, it's all of the above um, because the, the scale of magnitude 
um, of change that we're talking about is so significant that I don't think one particular vertical, um, be it on the private sector or on the public sector, is really enough to move the needle in isolation. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll start with the U.S. as an example in that and it's a chicken or an egg problem is that like there's there's a ton of regulation now. Right. And that that's unprecedented at scale from a sheer capital standpoint, but also um, from a signaling standpoint as well. We are in a four year political system, so who knows what's the lasting impact of that. But in the interim, while that exists, it's really created a ripple effect to in some ways incentivize uh entrepreneurs and, and, and companies, I'd say there's also like a lot of corporate mandates that have been publicly announced to address this space. So it's all in the above. I will say that uh, what we've seen to be the most effective is the coupling and combination of both the carrot and the stick. And there's really no other way to slice it, to be very frank. We'll take, we'll take the EV, um, infrastructure as an example, right? So as a consumer, you are incentivized to buy electric vehicles, but that really isn't enough. And that's really not where the buck stops. So you have to continue to incentivize all, really all stakeholders in the production cycle. Um, and I think that with, without that combination um, of the stick and the carrot on both the public and the private sector, it's really, really not enough to move the needle in a duration that I think we need. Um, are there folks that I think are interesting that are doing this? I think every region has has sort of like prime examples of this, but then also where they fall short. Uh, from a narrative standpoint, I think the, the EU broadly still leads the US, even within the US. I mean, we're such a large country. Um, you know, states like California are significantly more advanced um, than really most of the rest of the country. But I also think that there's something we need to taper around progress and that what is ideal, like idyllic in, in, our, in our goals and what's actually achievable because often a lot of the innovation that we're talking about, even some of these, um, you know, the, another example I'll use is consumer retrofits or residential retrofits, a huge area of change. There's a lot of regulatory support as a household owner or as a business, um, as a business owner, you are incentivized not everyone can afford it, so they, they they need they need they need that support, um, and I think that will end up happening. And what we're seeing is capital will continue to trickle in, um, and hopefully, what that means is there's just a lot more hope for folks in this space. Um, I think little to add. I think uh, I would like to point out difference in in the length of the stick between the U.S. and, and Europe in the subsidiary programs. In the U.S., it's a very short stick, and it's very uncomplicated for companies to apply for certain uh, for certain grants or subsidies. In, in Europe, we have on paper comparable programs, but it's it's a mess. I think that's definitely something to work on. Um, something where I experience also simply a lot of incumbents on a day-to-day -day is the hesitance of corporates to work with uh, technological innovation. That's nothing that popped up in green tech. That's a, an old problem. And that, that technology transfer always has been painful uh, for a variety of reasons. But I think uh, now um, what is unprecedented is the, the speed of regulatory change and also how severe companies are going to be hit by not adapting quickly enough. So I think this is something where we hopefully will see an actual pickup in in speed because the, the like how severely any corporate of this world has to re-innovate, has to overwork all processes uh, is um, quite extensive. And that that uh, if I were to sit on, a, on the corporate side, it would scare me. I'm sitting on, on my side. That part at least is a bit more comfortable and I'm actually looking forward to it because we need it. I would, uh, so I would myself focus more on the political side, but I would say I absolutely agree with Nick when he says that there's a kind of a, I wouldn't say unwillingness because it's too strong of a word, but there, there's definitely the entrepreneurial culture, the openness to innovation is really not the same. That's not a stereotype between the US and Europe. And when we talk about this specifically in France, we still don't have the cultural basis to 
actually incentivize more entrepreneurs to go into this kind of field. So I would say it's uh, it, it's going to be a collective effort. We're going to have to, we can't uh, create, recreate a Silicon Valley in Europe. That's not going to work. We have to find our own way of doing things and of really, you know, with Europe's very unique uh, culture and identity, how can we build an economy that is more driven towards towards uh, tech for good movements or technology and innovation. And I think that's something that's possible. You know, we just have to change uh, the cultural, you know, cultural way of seeing things to accept more risk, to to put more money on the table when needed. And eventually, for me, this comes down to governments really making it a priority, making innovation and the green transition a priority because it is, because it is, you know, between a huge international fields where you have a, a lot of countries who are doing really well and we're much ahead of us. We really have to think of a of our own way to get to get a little bit ahead in the race. Okay, great. Um, before we bring on some startups, I'm going to ask a few more startupy questions. Um, you know, uh, the the VCs on the panel are are doing. What, I want to know a little bit more about how do you measure your impact when you do investments? What are some key, key criteria, key metrics that you look at for startups? And also, Hen, just from a political side of it, well, what, I mean, it's a long, you know, you just can't just roll out something and then see something in six months, um, how many people get signed up for an app or something, right? This is a lot more uh, detailed and a lot more long-term. Maybe you guys can talk a little bit about that. Like, what do you, how do you guys look at these deals? How do you look at startups? What are like two or three key things that you need to see um, that they've achieved to a certain point before you cut a check for this or um, you know, see them be having some sort of impact in what they do. I'm, I'm happy are to are you up. asking how we measure the impact or how we yeah, decide how do you look, yeah, how do you look at they... yeah what do you, when you look at a startup before you invest, like what 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 are you looking at exactly? What me metrics are you looking at that they're achieving that you think, oh, this is something I want to invest in? Is it that or is it something I, I else? Um, well, from a metric standpoint, it really depends, right? It depends on a variety of things like their business model, what sector, what stage. Um, it, I will say that the, the broad general framework with how we think about whether or not a company is interesting is, is not any different than whether or not we, if they're an impact or if they're not an impact, it's, it really is boiled down to three questions. One is, you know, what is the problem that they're trying to solve for? Is this a, is this a, a need to have or a nice to have? Um, number two is this, this team, be it, you know, the technology or the actual team best position to solve it. And then the third question is, you know, what are, how big is the market? What are the market dynamics? Uh, so it's, those are the things that I would say we have to get real conviction on um, before we, before we dive in any deeper. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's, I don't, I don't know if that answers your questions around metrics, but um, that's really our framework for thinking. Oh, that's great. How about you, Nick? So we started Planet A with the conviction that if we replicate the view that we have on companies, that we're likely going to replicate the outcomes and that we mm. build an economy that is predominantly focused on financial KPI um, and that we need to extend that set of KPIs. And so um, whenever we invest, we run something called life cycle assessments. Run life cycle assessments is not something that we invented. It's basically the gold standard for impact measurement. It's a complete holistic overview of all materialistic and energetic inputs that are needed to create a certain product. So I, for example, look at my phone and then I look at the um, emissions that are connected to the mining of the raw materials, the transportation emissions, the production emissions, the use phase, as well as the end of life. So how can it be recycled? Um, I do this for the innovation and we do this for the status quo. Uh, taking averages for the status quo, and then we compare it in different dimensions and decide, okay, is this actually better than what we have today? And maybe even also worse, might be better on CO2, but might be consuming um, uh, more water as well. So then that would be negative. And we, uh, in the end, we are then putting ourselves into the position of being able to draw a conclusion between per generated unit of revenue, the generated unit of positive impact is X, Y, Z which then we extrapolate into the future with growing market shares and growing market sizes potentially and come to a conclusion whether we believe that this is significantly better than what we have 
and where that should be part of the future to make sure that the responsibility of capital can somehow be uh, mirrored in, in those investment decisions. And impact also has a role. So we have a team of scientists that calculate those life cycle assessments. And if they say, uh uh, this is this is not what we've been what we've been searching for, then this actually is a is a no go from an investment point of view. Interesting. And what do you see as something a key metric that would be successful uh, for a startup or tech company that's doing tech for good? Yeah. So I think in uh, tech for good and you know just tech companies working in fields related to politics or public administration, the first thing is, it, does it work? Which it, like sounds like uh, very straightforward, but you need to be able to convince the person you're talking to, it can be a public official or whom, whomever that is, that it works and it works on the long run because a lot of officials are, you know, public officials have had experiences that were pretty disappointing. And uh, I hear a lot of them telling me, okay, there's this great tech company, but it doesn't work. So we see that it's beautiful, the, you know, the, the shape is great and the design is great and it works for one month and two, but then what happens? So the, the, then what happens is the kind of story that you need to be able to tell and sustain success, especially if you're working in the public sector is very important because uh, usually you'd be getting grants from public money. So these people need to be able to uh, tell their constituents or, you know, their audience that this is working and we're doing this for a good reason. So, so the first thing, it works and it works on the long run. Uh, I would say that scalability is very important, especially if you're, there are a lot of um, state startups, quote unquote, state startups, which are pure projects that kind of startups, entrepreneurs who have ideas that can help the government work better. And so in that case, you need to make sure that you have a scalable model, but also that you have, um, which is kind of a con contradiction, but in the public sector, it's very important if you kind of want to do something on the long run, especially today, to make sure that you have a strong business model because it's uh, the type of companies, at least here and at least now, a type of company where people expect you to actually make money. We expect it to make money, even if it's innovation. I don't know if this is good or not, but uh, profit is very important and it's sort of a few, the few metric. But I would say the most important is that you can show that this works and you have, even if you start very, very, very small, you start, but uh, have an exponential growth. And that's the best way to prove that your model works and that it, it will keep growing. Okay, great. All right, before this is one last question before we're going to start because I'd like to have some context in terms of what you guys think are some of the most uh, exceptional startups in tech for good space right now. Um, and maybe, to, maybe they can be from your portfolio is, is good as well. But I'd like to know, like you brought up EV CETA already. So we know like that everybody sees that every day. But what are some maybe some change making startups that you think maybe need a little bit more spotlight or doing some really exciting stuff right now that you'd like to promote let's start with Sita. like is there any what startups or what tech startups are like exciting to you right now um well it's hard for us not to be biased to our own portfolio that's fine so go for I it forgive, <laughs> forgive me but i'm gonna start there um you know i i think that one of the companies that we invested in early um was a company that was originally born to to try to create a solution for the infant formula space that you know it has in, in some ways um a supply chain that does have very um very consequential impact on the environment as well um but the company is transformed into essentially becoming um an ingredient platform that provides next generation ingredients uh for the future of con consumer products um over a wide variety of them i, I think the reason I bring them up as an example is, is twofold. One is that um, oftentimes the most interesting problems are the ones that are, are not the most obvious. Um, when we when we were looking at the space, uh, the, the the players in the space were, I would say, legacy players, and it seems like you know innovation in it was was not um, possible. And I think that that's something that like sort of like look where no one is looking, if you will. And then the other thing that I would say is we really love platform businesses and we love businesses that have uh, the, the flexibility to be able to transform their business model in a way that makes more sense. Um, so they started off in one in sort of in one business model and they, they really became 
um, and evolve to become a true technology platform. Um, and we love businesses model, business models like that. I will echo Hen's point earlier around profitability. I don't know if I would use the exact same language, but I will say that there is no sustainable solution that is long-term sustainable if it's not cost competitive. Uh, I, I think that it can be bullied up with, uh, with you know, regulatory support for a short period of time or even a medium period of time. But in the long run, no business will adopt a new technology or partner with a new company um, if it ultimately doesn't provide both top line benefit and, and, and essentially help them on the bottom line as well. And no consumer will pick um, a different product um, over a sustained period of time if they have to be paying a, a, a continuous premium on it. So I, I can't emphasize that enough and that this isn't this isn't interesting because it's a pressing problem just for the planet. It's also interesting for us in particular because we think it's one of the greatest wealth creation opportunities of our generation. But in order for it to be such, the companies that are in the space have to really recognize that they, they they need to think of themselves not as a company in impact, but just a company period. Um, and their impact will be more impactful if they are cost competitive. Great, excellent. How about you, Nick? Portfolio companies are okay. I know. Um, I think that in my opinion, one of the, probably the most underrated, but potentially still a bullet potential technology right now is supercritical geothermal energy. Um, so basically drilling, uh, super simplified drilling two holes um, into the ground, a couple of kilometers deep, cold water goes down, steam comes up, running through a turbine, you have electricity. Big advantage over wind and solar is it's based on continuous, so weather independent. Big trade-off is it's very expensive once you start to go very deep, so depth of three kilometers and more. That is, however, solvable um, because suddenly you only need something that can drill for very hard rock instead of trying to make tokamaks or other fusion reactors work. Um, and this is possible. And so there is a couple of companies out there that try to do that with either um, vapor um, or um, microwaves, lasers, uh, fire. It's really, really exciting. And I think, um, or I know that it holds the energy potential to fulfill our primary energy needs for a very long time. And uh, definitely something that I'm super excited about. Wow, very, very interesting. How about you, Hen? All right, that's a tough question. I think there are so many. <laughs> just pick one. <laughs> just pick one. Uh, I, I would say there are really great, great, great entrepreneurial adventures. Uh, there have been great entrepreneurial adventures in France in a tech for good world. You have back market, which is just, so uh, it's, it's not a startup anymore. It's, it became so huge. You have Vinted, but you also have, I think there's, maybe my pick would be Too Good To Go, which is, I don't know, I think they, they're, they're, they became pretty big too, but uh, the concept is just simply that they would uh, have partnerships with restaurants or supermarkets and all, it, it's against food waste. So all food that wasn't sold, instead of just throwing it away, they would um, just sell it back at a very cheap price. And so you have this app where you can uh, choose your, your just saw uh, you know your package for food package uh, and you can go and get it and i think it's a good idea because it's just so uh, i think what's really interesting about about impact companies is their ability to kind of create a circle and a, a really um you know impactful circle so it's not just selling food that is being wasted it's also maybe helping students mm -hmm. who don't have enough money to pay for the huge huge uh, you know, uh, living expenses that we have in Paris and with the inflation to help them eat a little bit uh, in a more healthy kind of way. So I would say yes, this one to good to go. Amazing. Yeah, I love it. All right. We've heard some amazing insights here on this panel. Next, we're going to take questions from some of the startups exhibiting at Web Summit 2023. But first, let's check out this video for Web Summit Qatar, our brand new event. Here more than ever before, I want to welcome each and every one of you. And we're back. All right. 
So uh, let's um, welcome up first up is Joelle from Second Medical Opinion. Start exhibiting Hello. at WebSum as part of our Alpha Startup Program. Hi, Joelle. Um, we have 10 minutes left. So why don't you ask uh, our panel here your, a question that you might have? Yeah, so uh, my first question is about health tech startups and the challenges they face uh, with regulation. Uh, I heard Sita speaking about the regulation, and I think, Hind, uh, it's more a question for you, given your background in politics and business. So the question is very simple. What strategy do you recommend for health tech startups like ours to establish, let's say, an effective collaboration with government agencies and try to drive policy changes? to eventually enhance uh, patient care innovation. I would look, I mean, it would be interesting also to hear Sita and Nick uh, feedback about this, but uh, yeah. Great, so uh, that's a very, very large question, but I'll be happy to take it. So I would say when you're looking to kind of get closer to officials, public officials and elected officials, you first have to make sure that you kind of know what precisely their priorities are, how you can meet those priorities. You know, it's, it's, this is the case for uh, just anybody you would talk to and if you wanna collaborate with them, I would say first, know exactly what their priorities are and kind of build an argument uh, around how you can help them achieve those priorities or you know, get a little bit further down the road when it comes to those priorities. The second thing is that, like I said earlier, elected officials want things, especially in the tech world, in, in France, I, I know France mostly, but I think it's the case also in some other European countries, because they are a little bit, uh, they're not so tech savvy, you have to show them that this is useful, that what you're doing is going to be a game changer kind of application or platform or whatever. So focus on understanding what they want, how they're going forward and what you can bring to the table uh, along these lines and focus also on, you know, uh, showing that it works. And as long as you're capable of, uh, like I said, even if you start very small, what they want to be able to know is that there is a certain impact and to be able to kind of have a vision around how is this going to look like in five years or 10 years because we're, we're in politics, so people get elected sometimes here for six years and, and they get reelected, so that's 12 years. And so, yeah, kind of uh, bring them along that vision of yours. But I think you have a, a very successful and sector that you're, you're you know, involved, being involved in, so it shouldn't be too difficult. Good. Thank you. Nick or Sita, do you want to weigh on on that one? I have no opinion about it, sorry. Okay, great. Okay, here's another startup, Tommaso Mobile Pack. How are you doing? What question do you have for the audience, for the panel here? Hi everybody, thank you for having me today. Um, we're in the business of uh, usable packaging and we're about to raise a seed round. So we'd like to ask uh, specifically Sita and Nick, uh, what is the one fundraising error that you, you see today um, startups in the sustainability space uh, do? if there is one specific that you can highlight within the specific space. Sorry, you said, what is the one specific fundraising, one? Fundraising error, mistake. Oh, fundraising error. Yes. The one fundraising error. Yes, um, for, for companies active in the sustainability space. I don't know if this would be an error, but I, I would say that in general, the best thing a company could do is being able to demonstrate uh, simply uh, their, their their need to exist. This is just to echo my earlier point and their unique competitive advantage. I think failing to do that um, in a succinct, simple way is a fundraising error. That makes sense. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I would say it's very stage dependent. I think for pre-seed companies, I would say not showing clearly that market is big enough and that the team is the right one to do the job for a uh, seat that there is uh, early signs of traction uh, for a series A that there is actual product market fit. In the end, I would say it's the same things that are clear for or that, that, are, that you have for non-impact tech startups. Yeah, I was expecting different answers from you guys. It sounds really straight of all the uh, VC uh, um, things that they want to see. 
Um, okay, Joel, let's go back to you. We have a couple yeah. more minutes, a few more questions. What's your next okay, question? So maybe one last question for the three of you. Um, what tips or best practices do you have for early stage startups looking to approach VC firms and let's say establish successful partnership? Um, I'm happy to, to, to go first. I would say um, build a relationship. Um, at the end of the day, 85, maybe a bit less, but roughly that, that number uh, of percent of the deals that actually get made are taken um, on the back of a human relationship and try to uh, understand, like try to be efficient in understanding with whom you want to talk. You don't need to talk to 200 people. You need to talk to the 10 or 15 right people that have an appetite for what you have to offer and try to then leave transactionality this is europe uh, and leave transactionality a bit at a doorstep and be authentic and build a relationship and also continue to invest your time and energy into building those relationships over time uh, because you'll really see people i would just like very quickly uh, totally agree although we haven't uh, i mean we're not i'm not a vc but uh, the investors we've been in touch with it's it's just been relationships so how do you like from the beginning build trust how do you take time even before needing to raise money way before months before just reaching out to investors trying to kind of get their insights their ideas about what you're doing even before raising the money so relationships that totally root that great tomaso you get the final question thank you so to hind I would love to ask uh, how what do you suggest to startups uh, that you know that have early stage uh, early stage so they have limited time uh, and money to invest uh, how to engage with government uh, and at country or european level for the ones that are stay that are based in europe what is the most effective way in terms of uh, in two uh, minutes in two minutes so just just to make sure are you talking about like how do we get uh, to a relationship with them or how do we build something with no money and uh no no in, engage in terms of maybe supporting uh, one segment uh, compared to let's say we're in the usable packaging space and we often feel the competition with uh, larger single use packaging players so within this you know uh, there is a little bit of uh, um unbalance between the resources we can invest into you know discussing with the european uh, government uh, in terms of uh, how can we push uh, this, uh, the, the innovation towards uh, reusable compared to single use? So, I mean, this uh, unbalance, how can you suggest we tackle it? So in the very, very short time that I have, two things. First thing is get, your, get yourself and your company out there. Make sure that you're everywhere so people see you. It can be on social media. It can be at conferences. Just get out there. It's actually the best way to get attention. And, you know, if you go to conferences and you have elected officials and they notice what you do, they're going to be interested. They'll come, they'll talk to you. First thing. Second thing is, like, don't hesitate to to just reach out to them directly, send emails, send, like, letters. It doesn't always work, but it really works. And just, like, to finish, I think uh, sometimes works. I think you, know, you don't need a lot of money if you had a good product and... If you have a great team or you yourself as an entrepreneur are passionate about what you do, you can absolutely get their attention. Super. Thank you. Amazing. Much. Amazing. Great way to end it. Thank you, Tommaso and Joel, for joining us. We'll see you guys on the show floor at Web Summit in Lisbon. Thank you to our panelists, Hind, Nick, and Sita. Thanks a lot for your time. I learned a lot. We'll see you at the Planet Tech stage, which will be um, at Web Summit. And we'll be doing another live stream on October 25th about inclusion in Web3. So hope to see you with that one. Last few promotional bits here. There are a few weeks left to secure your ticket for Web Summit. But join us in Lisbon. Uh, grab your tickets now, websummit.com slash tickets. Thanks to everyone again. Thanks to the team that put this together at Web Summit. Um, and one of the great things about Web Summit is Night Summit for incredible networking opportunities in some amazing venues across Lisbon. Hope to see you there. See you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.